How did you raise the budget for Rex Park Curse of the Golden Buddha? So we we took that out of our savings. And, you know, for that, we've been saving for years. And I just had this conversation with my wife. Uh, really, for all of our films, it's like, I have to make this. I just, I, I don't know what it is about me, but I have to make this. And... I needed to get it out of my system. And I thought that when I made Rex Park, I thought that if I make this, I'm good because I, I made it. I gave myself a shot. But that wasn't the case. But it was the case when I made Four Amigos. When I made Four Amigos, I was okay with never making another film again or not even being a part of the industry again because that was what I needed for my internal soul to accomplish. Um, and then obviously it led to other stuff, but I think sometimes you have a voice in you and you can choose to listen to it and apply action or you can ignore it. And I don't think I could have, I would have regretted life if I didn't listen to that voice that said, you've got to do it. You can't, you can't give up now. Um, you have to do it. So I dipped into my savings. And mind you, when we talk about stability, being in IT, it gave me the ability to have a savings and, and my wife working, us working together and, and aligning our efforts and savings to make those films. It was so vital towards the maturity of myself as a creator because even though some people will say it's horrible, some people will love it, it's low level sex, fart jokes, it's very experimental. Like when different characters come up on the barcodes, It'll be yellow for one character and then purple for another character. Or when my character gets slapped with poop, the barcodes turn brown. Like it was, and there's cheesy, really just bad graphics. It was very experimental that I found hilarious because that's just my sense of humor. Um, my wife absolutely hates it. I have friends that absolutely hate it. And then I have other people that absolutely love it. And I knew that that's what that film was when I created it. But by creating that film, and getting the confidence in the, in the schooling of doing. There's something to be said about experience and doing that once you're able to build that confidence and that trust in yourself that you can do it, and you're able to see like on set where you can get better, how you can get better, how you can treat people better, how you can talk to people better, how you can collaborate better because you can't make a film without all of your talent and crew, you just can't. It, it, you can shoot yourself, but it's a boring film. You need the collaborate, collaborative effort of everyone. Um, and that's the beauty of film, it's, it's collaboration. But without it, I would have never gotten to the point where I'm at now, which is 10 steps further than where I was three years ago. Because the films, the national commercials, the print jobs, and I've worked with Apple, Samsung, McDonald's, Subway, like you name it. I, I, didn't do anything for my career. It didn't push me forward or anything. It, all it did was give me knowledge um, as to what it looks like on set. How do people kind of do things? I did take that experience and then applied it to my films. Um, but it, it, you have to get that first film out of the way. What resources did you already have? So I had the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Um, so here's one of the big lessons that I learned on Rex Park to Four Amigos and a Pizza Boy Rick. On Rex Park, I had the Sigma 18 to 35 millimeter lens because everyone raved, oh, this is the lens, the, the sharpness, it's so great. They're right, it's a good lens. But what I realized in making that first film is what my style was and what I wanted to capture. You can't capture with an 18 to 35 mil. I like shooting in 50 mil to 100 mil and in that space. So because I, I, I realized that, that with the Blackmagic camera now, with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6 6K, you shoot that raw. And I paired that with the Canon L2 series lens, 
24 to 105 lens, it did two things. It gave me the focal range that I wanted and it allowed me to save time on set because a lot of times you're running and gunning when you're shooting because I didn't have to change out the lens. I could just zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. It, it changed everything for me because I was able to get a higher quality production just out of the, the, the lens camera setup because in reality, yeah, you can have the three-point lighting system, right? Front, side, and the back to kind of separate you from the background. But when you're shooting 10 scenes in three hours in one location, you don't have time for all that. So make sure that that person that's in light, that okay, they're good, and you can be agile. So every time you shoot a new scene, you're gonna move that light, boom. But if you have to set up three lights, you might not be able to get that in time. And if you don't do it that day, you might not be able to get that location again. So there's, there's little things and caveats that you learn from shooting a movie and having that black magic with that 24 to 105 mil lens and one powerful light, just one. I would tell any filmmaker, we all know lighting is, is one of the most important things when shooting. Spend the money on a real powerful light because that one powerful light would do you more justice than having three lights that aren't as powerful. And I learned that on my lesson on Rex Park because we were shooting this scene on the background, right? And it was really bright, it was sunny outside. And one of the things uh, that I hate, and I did it, and I hate it when I see it, but it was it's because the tools that I had at the time is for any filmmaker out there, if you want to light it right, you light for the background, you put that, um, uh, you put your aperture settings for the background so it's not overblown and you can see all the details. Then you light artificially your actor in frame. So then that's how you get that really good dynamic range and balance where the background is not overblown and this person is, is in shot lit well. If you light the actor in front and it's so bright in the back, then that means that's gonna be blown out just so you can light this person well. And that tends to not look well in the final product. So lens, camera, one powerful light. And sometimes you can even just do like a little bounce board to just kind of get what's bouncing off. So you already had those in your filmmaking kit, if it will. Uh, I bought those. Oh, you bought those. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so I, I bought the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K because I knew that it was probably the most cinematic looking camera that you could get at the time for that budget. Um, and then I bought the Sigma and then, and then I bought cheap lights. That's how I knew like the eBay light kit, even though there's three of them, it just, it did what it needed to do to teach me my lesson, but it wasn't good enough to pr produce the result that I wanted from a production value and quality standpoint. But I did have to bite down and buy the camera and buy the lens. Ah, uh, but then you use them going forward to other Absolutely. productions. Okay, so that helps with the budget going Absolutely, forward. Absolutely, because now it's almost like an investment. You already own that. And there's, there's power, especially in 2022, there's power in owning your gear because you don't have to wait to shoot something. You can shoot it outside in your yard, your park, your parking garage, your friend's house. You can shoot because you own it. So when you buy gear, in a sense, you're investing in yourself and the extension of your capabilities. Do you ever factor in when will this gear be obsolete? When, when, will, I, when will I need to move on? There'll be something bigger and better? Mm -hmm. No, because you know you can still watch a DVD that, shot in 480, that, that is in 480p final rendered and still enjoy it. And in reality, this is a, a really good advice for filmmakers. You have to make sure that if you're shooting in 6K, 4K, 12K, that your computer can handle it. Because if you don't have the right GPU, CPU, RAM, and all of that stuff to shoot, it's, it's not gonna work. So like with editing Four Amigos and Pizza Boy Rick, I had to buy a 3090 Ti. I didn't wanna put that on my credit card, but I had to buy that GPU to edit because once you add color grading, and a lot of times I like to sonically and visually, I like my films to kind of look like 80s and 90s. Really, I like it to look 90s, but sonically sound 80s. Um, that once you convert that digital footage to film grain, you add your color grade, you soften the images so it doesn't have that digital sharp look because it's film, 
that GPU and that CPU is working and your computer will have a hard time, even with the 3090 Ti to do 6K raw, a lot of times you have to take that 6K, do a 1080p timeline, do all your editing and hope that when you render in something like DaVinci that it doesn't crash. So making sure that your computer is, is beefy enough to handle that footage is a big thing because if, if not, don't let that stop you from not filming. But maybe the Blackmagic 6K is not the best option. Maybe the Blackmagic 4K is the best option because you can shoot 4K raw and maybe that doesn't tax your system as much. Or maybe the original Blackmagic where you still get that cinematic 1080p because your system can handle that 1080p. But it's better for you to, to be progressive and shoot and make advancements than to wait and wait and wait for gear. Now, if you're going to upgrade from something like the original Blackmagic or and get something better, then yeah, save up for it, plan for it, but don't let that stop you from creating.